Thanks very much. I'm not actually going to be speaking. I'm just here to really introduce a, a very, very distinguished panel. But just to say a few words to start off with, it's absolutely amazing to be here. I've never felt so empowered and surged full of the energy of a wonderful group of people who are here in the room today. So thanks very much to Sharon and all of her team for making all this possible. I'm sure everybody here feels the same. Um, so I'm here to chair a panel about the, the role of the media in, in these matters and it's, it's very, very important that we do talk about this. So just to say a little about how I came to being a, a writer myself, I started out as an activist, I started out as a person who wanted to change the world and moved on into being a writer who wanted to use writing as, as a way of doing that. Um, I was one of the people who set up the Belfast Rape Crisis Centre in 1983 and I think it's something we should celebrate here today is the fact that out of the awfulness of the Belfast Rape Trial, a new Belfast Rape Crisis Centre is being set up and is going to work for women in Northern Ireland. Um, through having done that work and through being a young feminist, I, I brought that sensibility to being a journalist and my first book, Sophia's Story, which I wrote in 1998, uh, just to tell you a little about what I mean about bringing a feminist sensibility, I think one of the most important lines in, in that book was um, where Sophia was addressing the fact that many people's reaction to her story, which was one of having been brutally abused along with her siblings by her father for many, many years, was why didn't their mother save them? And Sophia says in the book, my mother couldn't save us, she was one of us. And to me, that is what is feminist about Sophia's story. And I think that's what feminist journalists are trying to bring to the work that they do. Um, we, and there are many, many brilliant feminist journalists in this country, we've told a lot of stories, but as Encia was talking about earlier, there are many, many stories which have not been told. And many of those stories have not been told because when feminist journalists go to editors asking to tell those kind of stories, which are women's stories, they're often stories of women who have no power whatsoever in their communities, in their societies, they're not recognised as being significant people. And just to give you an example uh, from my own experience recently, you heard from the wonderful Suzanne Connolly earlier, and I had the great privilege of being the journalist to whom uh, Suzanne first told her story um, and, and brought it to the public domain just shortly before her stepfather was uh, convicted. But uh, when I spoke to an editor, a particular editor, male editor, about that story, he was highly unimpressed by it and sort of, I was arguing to get quite a bit of space for it. And he said, look, it's a Belfast story and it's a Wednesday. <laughs> Whatever the hell that means. But, um, you know, there is this so what attitude which journalists are, are faced with and have to give great credit to um, Roisin Ingle, who's here today, is that she picked up the story. And... Um, did a, did a really profound, lengthy, respectful interview with Suzanne as part of the women's podcast in the Irish Times. So I think Ro Ro Roisin deserves a round of applause for that. <laughs> But it is, it is a macho male dominated profession in Ireland as elsewhere and, and you know, Bruce has, has referred to that as well I think in, in what he's talking about. You know, you're bringing stories to a profession which isn't entirely always receptive to them. Um, Kira Rose spoke earlier about her horrific experience of uh, appearing on a panel with Ian O'Doherty. I just remind you, these creeps are our colleagues, you know. We have to work with these guys. They treat other women journalists in exactly the same dismissive and disparaging way. And just to, before I bring on the panel, because I realise I've now been going on and on, uh, I recently read something on Twitter about someone who said that um, I feel so angry that I feel as if every time I open my mouth, my mouth a swarm of bees is going to come out of it. <laughs> and uh, so there you are, I'm your balanced host for this next session. <laughs> um, So I'm just going to ask the panel to come onto the stage and then I'm going to tell you who each of them is. So if they'd all just come up and give them a round of applause as they join us. Now this is going to be a, a conversation. So instead of each person, um, you know, giving a spiel, um, 
we're going to have a conversation in which questions are going to be directed to each person and then they'll talk to each other and, uh, and I'll try and ensure that uh, people get a fair share of the time. Uh, Luke Hart, I think many of you heard from yesterday, unfortunately I wasn't here to hear that. Uh, Luke's father murdered Luke's mother and sister and Luke and his brother Ryan have become very powerful advocates against violence against women and they are particularly, or Luke today is, going, is particularly speaking about how concerned he was with the way that in the media the murderer's voice was given authority uh, whereas, um, and he, allowed, he was allowed to portray himself as a victim and all of us who've worked in the Irish media know many, many stories like that. Uh, Bruce, you've, you've just heard from, uh, he runs the DART Centre in Columbia University and supports journalists to report trauma and violence and to look after themselves in the process of doing so. Cindy Southworth is uh, the Executive Vice President of the US National Network to End Domestic Violence and in 2000 she founded the Safety Net Project to address the role of technology in violence against women and she's going to focus today on social media, uh, its challenges and also its benefits in, in doing this kind of work. Um, Anne O'Brien, um, she lectures at the Department of Media Studies at NUI Maynooth and her research focuses on gender and the creative industries and she's currently working on a really interesting project looking at how the Irish media can report better on gender-based violence because I think, you know, Bruce put it well, we need to look at what we can do to make it better. Um, Adele Hackett uh, self-defines herself as working in advocacy public relations. She's been with Safe Ireland for 10 years and they're very lucky to have her. Before that, she worked with the Rape Crisis Network of Ireland and she's also worked with Ruhama, which works with women in prostitution. And she's done work on, with organisations working on housing and drug taking. And she's concerned about the low coverage of issues which are of burning importance. And she is also interested in how complex uh, the media is and again about encouraging best practice. So um, I'm just going to join the panel and um, I'm going to start off asking Cindy to talk about what she was talking to me earlier about, which is the love triangle. Can you tell us about the love triangle and what that says about how it shouldn't be done? Um, many, many years ago when I just started in this work, there was a, a double homicide suicide which happened to be on my birthday and the survivor or not survivor, she didn't survive. The victim who was killed was also had the same birthday, just a fluke of fate. But she had left her controlling, dangerous partner, rebuilt to life, was dating a new man, had a lovely relationship, and her ex hunted her down, premeditated, broke in, and in the middle of the night killed her and her new partner. And the media portrayed it as a love triangle. My head exploded, I was so enraged. Because this is not, Romance. This is not Romeo and Juliet. This is premeditated, calculated double murder. Yeah, and that's something obviously that comes across frequently in, in relation to media coverage of violence, and it's something that, that you'll be talking about, Luke. Um, I just want to maybe go to Anne next and ask you, Anne, like, how, how do you get away from that? How do you stop that way of covering real violence as if it was something sort of amusing to read? Mm. I think it's really important to start with journalists and to start asking them how they end up in those places, like what are the mechanisms through which stories get written that end up in those places. And so my research is about engaging with journalists and getting them to describe the process through which they tell stories about domestic violence. And one of the issues they bring up in an Irish context is the sources that are available to them at something like a murder-suicide are very, very limited. The Gardaí, which is the Irish police force, will be the main <coughs> and the gatekeepers on information. And they're very slow to divulge any information. So there's two key things they'll say. One is a tragedy has occurred, and the other is they're not looking for anybody in relation to the crime. And that's about the limits of the information that's forthcoming to journalists. That sends journalists on then to talk to religious leaders, which in the Irish context is usually a kind of local Catholic parish priest who will give information, but also frame the story in terms of this being a terrible cross for a family to bear. And from there, journalists will talk to sports organizations like GA clubs, talk to neighbors, bystanders, none of whom have any expertise. And what's missing there, it's interesting that, you know, globally, women are the sources for stories in only 24% of cases. 
And when it comes to domestic violence, advocates and activists are the sources for stories in only 6% of all the stories covered. So this, the Gardaí are given this very privileged voice, but don't give any information, and the people who don't get to speak then are often the victims or the people best qualified to talk about this story. The second thing that gets in the way then is the way that journalists frame stories. So there's kind of long-standing traditions in which people are trained into the industry, socialized into it. There's a whole culture around how journalists tell stories. And oftentimes, um, they are, the domestic violence stories get told in the way they've always been told. And I, when I speak to journalists and say, why did you not call that murder-suicide a domestic violence incident? They would say, oh, I couldn't make that leap. Um, because there's no tradition of naming those stories that way. Editors do talk about being open to covering domestic violence stories, but they are a little bit cagey around it. And their caginess comes from a sensitivity they would claim to not wanting to upset families or communities. Um, but equally, they are wary as well of potential defamation issues in more feature-style productions. Um, but they do claim to be open to uh, increasing the coverage there. The other thing that came up for journalists was the relationship with advocacy agencies. And they have a sense that a lot of activists and advocates kind of tar them all with their own brush, don't distinguish enough between good journalists and not good journalists, um, and that there's a need there for more engagement. So I suppose the good news is that there's a piece of work that can be done with the Irish police force around how they disseminate information. There's a piece of work to do in the universities, back where we work, with training young media workers, young journalists, into thinking differently about this issue and being able to name it as domestic violence or as gender-based violence. There's work, editors are open to engagement, particularly around something like generating new guidelines, constantly innovating on guidelines, and going beyond just guidelines to offering guidance. And they would very much proactively welcome uh, engagement from advocacy organisations working in the area. And I think I through those three go things... On to, the, to the guidelines thing in, yeah. in a few minutes, but just maybe to stick at the moment with the moment with this, there is actually a whole genre, Bruce, isn't there, called true crime? You know, well, sure. which, which kind of emanates, I think, really in America, but which is also part of the media scene here. Sure, and th but that's often, you know, the, whether it's in the re sort of reality TV reconstructed crime form or in print form, that's based on the idea of true, cr of, of engaging with people's fear and arousal. Um, you know, we all are fascinated by violence in the world, but we also don't want to think about it too much. Right, so I think there is the true crime genre. I think the bigger the problem with covering the issues like Anne is talking about is that journalists goes back to this question of training. Though, mm. is about you wouldn't send someone to cover a football match who doesn't know what the rules are, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. and yet we send the youngest reporters out yeah. to interview families and survivors and to the scenes of crimes and to try to track down these stories without any framework for understanding. Domestic violence. We do the same thing with baby judges and baby yeah. prosecutors. Yeah. What yeah. you just had a school, yeah. you should handle yeah. the toughest cases. Go for it. Yeah. And I think, and then I think there's also something else, which is that a lot of reporting practice traditionally follows the criminal justice system. It starts with with the guardie, but it also then goes on through the courts and trials. And courts are about determining the guilt or innocence of a perpetrator, right? Survivors, victims, families are to a certain extent pieces of furniture in that process. We, your exhibits along the way to achieving a social end. Part of the challenge is to recognize that journalists have a responsibility to do the opposite of what courts do, to elevate and keep present the experiences of survivors and to understand that the long post-traumatic journey, whether it's of the uh, survivor of domestic violence or family members who have lost someone in a murder, that this is a new story that unfolds over time and needs to be covered. That the lives of survivors themselves are part of the news as much as the criminal justice process in which the perpetrator 
plays uh, a central role. So it's, yeah, it's no, all, it's I'll stop you at that actually, Bruce, because we're, we're really rushing on time here. And I, I would like to bring Cindy back in just in relation to something you just said there about the responsibility of journalism. I mean, you, your work is a lot to do with social media, isn't it? And there is, like certainly during the Belfast rape trial recently, there was this kind of these two parallel worlds of what was going on in the mainstream media and what was going on in social media. I mean, where does the responsibility come in in terms of social media? One thing that I think of is how for literally decades since many of the, the founding, men, mostly mothers of this movement, um, they really help survivors understand that you are not the statute. So if you experienced a horrifically invasive thing, whether or not it meets the letter of the law, you can still have experienced trauma. And I think when it comes to social media, we need to do something very similar is whether or not somebody is convicted doesn't mean it didn't occur. And so the I believe her and then I love the sue me patty response was so in your face, well done Ireland. Yeah. Um, <laughs> It, and it's the point is, and you know, we can see things in the U.S., something may have happened, but that doesn't mean a group of white men decide that, meh, we're not so concerned about rape, we're going to put you on the Supreme Court. Um, so, you know, truth, justice, and people's experiences can be very different, exper different things. Mm -hmm. What I find with social media right now is it's a bit of a revolution, is it's opening doors for activists to tell our own stories and not have to rely on mainstream media. And I think it's a both and. Mm -hmm. We need to work with mainstream media, change the way they're covering these stories, and for the nonprofits in the room, you know, please do not treat your social media presence at your refuge or your, your rape crisis center as cute or fluffy or an add-on. It's you taking responsibility of telling your own story and not waiting for mainstream media to catch up. Um, yeah, there were some pretty nasty social media movements that came out sort of as in um, I don't believe her and so on as well. And there was a lot of warfare between those movements, which is probably yeah. common in other situations as well. The, I would say one of the most personally wrecking for me in ages, I was sitting in Newark Airport on Friday, September 22nd, reading why I didn't report and literally in an airport, just mm -hmm. tears pouring down my face. And what was so poignant for me is so many survivors not only don't report, people were assuming that means police involvement, most survivors don't tell anyone, family, friends, partners, loved ones, because they can't, because their perpetrator, like in my case, is a relative. Mm -hmm. And so many people don't report and don't share and don't disclose, and, but the people who chose to and then the survivors that have been sharing their stories on stage the past few days, I just, I have so much awe because it, it, it is really triggering to share your own story, whether you do it through Twitter or at a, an event like this. But you know, social media has such power to be able to open those doors. Thanks, um, Adele. I'd like to come on to you now. I mean, you you work on both sides of this, don't you? You work with journalists and you work with organisations. Yeah, yeah. You work with organisations that are trying to get stories told on yeah. behalf of people. What's what would be your perspective on this? Um, my perspective, I, I think I have to say, first of all, I've been working in this area for 20 years and I have huge respect for journalists. I think the work that they do is really, really difficult. I see people running in, they've got five minutes to get a story, file a story. It's even become much more difficult now because they don't just have to file a story. They've, they're expected to do Twitter, they're expected to put stuff up on Facebook, they're expected to take a video. You know, everything has become so meshed that I actually think the world of the journalist is really, really difficult. Um, I suppose for me, what can be frustrating is, is that journalists, the journalists that I meet, first of all, they tend to be the younger journalists that often come. Now, the other thing is that I don't think that we can tar all journalists with the same brush. We tend, even the, this, you know, this session is called the role of the media. I mean, the media is huge. There's different types of media. I looked at the coverage from today. I looked at the coverage of Amanda Carroll, who was killed two days ago. There's an enormous difference in the way in which different media deal with the same story. Um, and so I think that we can't always sort of rush to say, you know, and, and think that the media is the way in which tabloid papers um, uh, uh, portray things. Could you give us some examples of that? Could well, you? even today, I mean, today on the Irish, on, in the Evening Herald, um, there's a picture of, um, of Amanda Carroll on the very front page. That picture has obviously been taken from Facebook. It's been taken without her permission. Um, and I suppose what I think about when I see a headline or a, a front story, a front page like that is, 
what is that doing to the family? How is that re-traumatizing that family? Um, and I, I think too, too uh, I had a conversation with Maria Dempsey here um, two years ago, um, more than two years ago at this stage, at the, at the summit uh, in 2016. And Maria, I hope you don't mind that I use this story, but Maria told me about her two younger children who were in school. Um, and they did a little project. They had to look up the internet. And when they looked up their names, they were associated only with the death of their sister. And that really, really traumatized those two children. So I suppose one of the things that I feel is that, you know, journalists come into a launch, it's a day, it's a deadline, it's, it's today's news. But actually, those stories, because of the internet, stay on the news, stay on the internet. They don't leave. Um, they, they, you know, they can, they're, they're never going to go away. So a bit, I think, I really liked the point that you made, which was that it's, I don't want to change media because media has to be independent. Media cannot be an arm of the advocacy sector. If that was the case, we wouldn't have democracy. Um, but I like the idea that, um, that, that we, can, we can work together um, that the media can learn from the advocacy sector and we have to learn an awful lot from the media as well. Um, again, you know, one of the questions that's always asked is, have you got a woman? And sometimes we kind of go, why do they ask, have, they got, have we got a woman? We have this wonderful report, we have all these statistics. But the thing is that media doesn't, doesn't deal in information, it deals in stories. Journalists talk about stories. So as an advocacy sector, I think we have to be more prepared to meet the media halfway in what they need, but then for them to be respectful of the needs of the survivors in particular. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. I've had that experience firsthand having worked in a rape crisis centre where you know you constantly got calls from journalists saying, could you get me a Catholic who was married by a British soldier yeah. or could yeah. you get me yeah. a yeah. Protestant yeah. who was murdered or was raped yeah. by an IRA man and you yeah. do feel as if you're running a mail order service exactly. way, <laughs> no, it's for true. victims. It's, but yeah, I feel sometimes that it's like victim on demand mm -hmm. and it can't always be like that. Um, it's not appropriate sometimes. You know, I've often had s situations where I've had to ring women up that I don't really know to see if they will talk mm -hmm. to the media, just to fuel this fire. And then if we don't provide the woman, the story gets dropped. So I think we have, there has to be a halfway house where this, the advocacy sector uh, meets the media, but the media also understands the constraints under which this sector works as well. Um, thanks. Um, Luke, you've obviously had the experience of being in a family where there has been extreme violence and you've interacted with the media and you've been critical of the media. Would you tell us about that? Um, yeah, so uh, I guess uh, me and my brother obviously recognise that one of the things that's really hard for the media is to actually see what was going on. It's really hard for them to get the information. But one of the things that struck us was that even in that situation, there was still a bias towards our father's perspective. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I guess one thing, for example, is that they were asking people on the street what our father was like. They never asked anyone what our mother was like or our sister, for example. So right from the start, they were kind of, you know, driving that perpetrator-centric perspective. But I think one of the, th the things is, even if the information's not there, it's really important the worldview that the media creates. So we noticed one thing was that it's very much treated as a family issue, a personal issue. But as we've been speaking about today, it's societal gender violence that's manifested in the family. And for one thing, that just makes it feel like there's nothing you can do. They create this feeling of inevitability and that it's trapped inside the home. But that's not true at all. Um, and one thing that really struck us as well is that, um, I guess, how would I put it? <coughs> For us, it was really, really difficult to see our mother and sister silenced. Mm. <laughs> mm. And I think the perspective is totally key. And the excusing our father, you know, rationalizing what he did almost made it seem like it made sense. Mm. And I think that it's really important that we try to find the story of the victims. And for us, that was 25 years long. Our father's story was five days long. And the silence is the perspective of the perpetrator. That's the narrative they've always had. So to treat 25 years if it never existed is fully going with our father. 
Mm. We left because we had to, but the media started on that day and there was not even a question of what happened before. There wasn't even the mention of domestic abuse, but there was the mention of mental health. Mm. It just, to us, it was the world view. And that's so critical because we had read these stories growing up and we were looking for a caricature of an abuser mm. that we never saw. And that's why we did nothing. And people will see mm. what happened using emotional language to describe what our father did, but it wasn't emotional. It was totally ideological and it was based on that entitlement. And unless we represent perpetrators as men who quite frankly aren't snapping, they're not losing control, they're not, having, mm. they're not mm. sad, mm. they're quite frankly just executing beliefs that they hold, then people won't understand. And I think the two key bits there is victims don't know what to look for and then basically murderers feel entitled and privileged to carry on. And I think it's really important that the media aims to tackle those two key elements fundamentally in the storytelling to the death threat. And did you find any journalists who were willing to explore the, the, the real stories? Um, so it took us a year. Um, all of, most of the reporting um, represented that worldview we were talking about that was incorrect. And it was only when um, we kind of went to the media and said, look, we want to tell that 25 year story um, that it came out. But even up to, I mean, obviously victims when they're traumatized can't give that story immediately. But I think it's really important that the media creates a worldview that we statistically know is the case, academically we know is the case. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. We need to represent the world, yeah. not just like, you know, these tiny disparate incidents. We need yeah. to show people the world because people, people experience this often in a tragic way. And if they have no warning beforehand, then quite frankly, I, I believe the media's failed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Part, part of, let me just say, part of the problem with how crime gets reported, and this goes back to the, the, the true crime genre, is that it's the most spectacular and unusual crimes that, of course, go to the top of the news and that we pay attention to. Mm -hmm. It's the ordinary, everyday quotidian violence in families and the ordinary, everyday, non-headline sexual harassment and assault, which are the most common ways that people are victimized. Mm -hmm. The new news coverage often is exactly the opposite of that, mm -hmm. gives people a completely incorrect view of where threats and safety really lie mm -hmm. in society. And that is a way in which journalism fails yeah. much of the time. And there's a, there's a patriarchy and, and racism overlay to that, that if it's a white entitled offender, perpetrator, murderer, they are portrayed as, oh my gosh, this amazing man just snapped. But you know, if the um, offender or perpetrator is a person of color, the mugshot is posted, not the swimming photo. Yeah. And so yeah. we have such a challenge in our yeah. world that we have to always look at not only male entitlement, but also white supremacy, yeah. because I just find it plays out over and over in the media. Yeah. Can, I, can I just say, um, Susan, um, I was thinking about how, and I was talking to somebody last night, and. You know, when you're, you're looking at the sort of the, the, the Ferris wheel of media um, and invariably there's enough time when you come in and you've got five or six minutes to kind of cover something, ask Sharon, is she ready for an, a, a, an interview? There's enough time to do the who, what, where and when. But the problem is, is that the why actually takes a long time. Mm -hmm. And the why requires resources. The, requ the, the why requires the, those who are leading and heading up media corporations to actually have the time to allow journalists to ask the why. Because I actually think most journalists want to get to the why, but they're not given the time, the space, the, um, the spread to be able to get to that point. And this goes back to what you were talking about, about the demise of investigative journalism. Yeah. Um, that unfortunately, we're kind of seeing surface journalism for the most part. And then there are amazing pockets, like the work that you do, but you have to, you know, spend a long time getting to know the real issues and getting to know the complexity of an issue like this. Well, I think the issue that Suzanne brought up earlier yeah. about grooming is very interesting, yeah. isn't it? That you know, we're, we are groomed as a society yeah. into obliterating yeah. domestic violence yeah. and violence against children and male violence yeah. against women and yeah. children. And part of that, Susan, How do you is deal where with the that? journalists go for the story and the mm -hmm. fact that they go to the police forces, which are very male-dominated mm -hmm. as well, have a very masculinist view on the world. And there's an interesting piece of work done in Australia by their own police force where they voluntarily began to look at how they were 
treating incidents of domestic violence and then also looked at their engagement with media and it did revolutionize how seriously the media took it when the police were taking it seriously. Mm -hmm. The media took their lead from them. Yeah, I remember being sent down to uh, a prison to talk to um, a man who had been just a very notorious character who had just been jailed for years and years of abusing his uh, daughter. And uh, the prison officer was very curious as to what I was doing there and he said, um, I, so he found out what case I was interested in and, and uh, he said, oh yeah, that was terrible. And I said, yeah, it was really awful what that young woman went through. And he says, oh no, no, no. He says, I didn't mean that at all. He says, that was very much a two-way story, you know. And started telling me all this stuff about how she had led him on and, you know, she'd been very provocative and all this. And, you know, because he'd obviously been listening to a lot of these sex offenders in the prison and he had yeah. completely sort of Dish, taken yeah. on this Dish. point of view, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So when you're up against the sort of notion as violence against women as being entertainment, it's very difficult to turn it into serious yeah. work, isn't it? Yeah. I also think it's so, challenging too for all of us to distill down complex, nuanced, thoughtful, trauma-informed points to pithy, quotable yeah. elements, but mm -hmm. I would say that Eileen and Mona prove that it is very possible. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah. definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and do you want to talk a little bit more about where you're hoping to go with your research? And we need to talk about guidelines as well. Is that something that's on the agenda? That's something mm -hmm. that both Luke and Adele will want to talk about as well? Sure. I think what the research has shown around guidelines is that when they're issued to journalists, they don't particularly work very well. Um, when I spoke to journalists about how aware they were of guidelines, they kind of had a notion that they did exist somewhere, they may be able to put their hands to them, but they weren't something that they engaged with very, very frequently, and yet they could simultaneously see that they were very useful. So what academic research is showing, it's that when advocacy agencies engage with journalists to generate guidelines together, that's when discussions happen. Yeah. You know, it was funny that even over the course of, you know, having a conversation with maybe a crime correspondent and asking them, why don't you name this as domestic violence? That was an intervention. They were kind of saying, well, because I don't and we don't. And yet, subsequently, I've heard a shift in language with particular individuals that you talk to. Mm -hmm. So it's that engagement, be it through research or through ag advocacy organizations engaging with journalism, that the thinking kind of changes and that you shift their framing on this. Mm -hmm. And Luke, you've been actually involved in drawing up guidelines or working on guidelines, haven't you? Or Yes, so, yeah, so I guess one of our key messages was the sort of socialization of the media. Mm. And, um, and I guess the starting point is to, you know, to try and detract from some of the, the key stereotypes. Giving, giving facts to the media is important, but I think we don't remember stats very well. I think the main thing to remember is just, you know, the storytelling template. And I think that's really important that we don't drive a storytelling template until it just becomes just you know, we just get stuck in it. And I think the key bit is to educate people about where true danger lies and then and basically wrapping the story in that. Because we didn't realize until after our, our tragedy just how often women are killed in the family, how dangerous partners are to women. The, the, the media, the general trend we'd picked up growing from the media was that outside is dangerous, inside is safe women need men to protect them. They don't at all. Women need to escape the men that are claiming to protect them, if anything. They need to run into dark alleyways for safety. Like, the home is where the danger is. So, and Mona, us, we, Mona definitely showed. You don't need a man to take care of you. Exactly, you don't at all. And I think this, it's hard for us to pinpoint where it came from, and we can't say exactly, but that's what we were taught, and I don't think we're the only people that have collectively been taught that. So guidelines are an important first step, but I think the storytelling is really key yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, to change that. Yeah. I, what what I, do you think, Adele? Yeah, I, just, no, so, sorry, um, I mean, I think, I'm glad to hear that Luke said that guidelines are a first step, because I, um, you know, because Luke and, and, and Ryan were coming over, I had to look at the level up uh, guidelines. And also myself and Anne and other um, advocacy groups are kind of currently working on the development of, we're not even going to guidelines, because we're not sure that it's guidelines that are needed. And I suppose um, when I looked at the level up guidelines, I thought they were great guidelines. But in my head, I thought, you know, there, I would see that it's kind of futile just to go to the media and say, here's 
here's our guidelines, now we want you to, um, you know, to, 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 to comply with them. I, I really firmly mm. believe that you have to work and engage with the media and understand their world, understand their challenges, understand the difficulty that they have in actually getting to the story. You know, as you said, just because it's, I believe her, the journal, the media can't say, I believe her. You know, if they believed everything that we said, we'd be in a very sad space, you know, particularly if they believe everything that, 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 that politicians say. So I, I think that we firmly have to... Um, but they can say she's credible. Hmm? They can say, they can she's, say credible. she's credible. Yes. But I think that guidelines are a really good first step. I think that we then have to take those guidelines and work with media so that they work for them. Um, you know, and then we have something that is actually sustainable, something that, we can, that is usable. And I'd really like to see that work, and I'd like to see that our work kind of be completed as soon as possible on that line. Yeah. And do you think that journalists should be engaged in the process of Absolutely. drawing up the guidelines? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, you know... They won't um, work if they're not, yeah. Susan, mm -hmm. like the guidelines yeah. will just fall on deaf ears yeah. because there's no engagement, there won't be appropriate yeah. guidelines, they won't be useful. Yeah. Journalists are the experts to lead on what the challenges are around yeah. telling this story. Yeah. The other thing we're really missing in Ireland is kind of a baseline study in terms of how much coverage does domestic violence get and what are the patterns to that coverage. Mm -hmm. We all know anecdotally the problems, but maybe also to look at where is some of the best practice happening, how is that happening, yeah. what is the nature of that. And there's a big question there around resources. Some of the domestic violence agencies need to be resourced to be able to engage more with media. Um, the media are very cognizant of the fact that oftentimes it's way down their list of priorities and for good reason, they're busy with service provision. I think that journalism training now is really having difficulties in terms of addressing these things because I recently was talking to trainers about, or to educators in journalism about dealing vict journalists dealing with victims of the of conflict and uh, they're basically saying oh you've no idea it's years since you trained it's all about technology now we don't have time to talk about these things yeah. you know so is there even discussion going on in journalism schools i mean maybe you could address that oh Bruce. sure no it's at a at a profound level there's there there are a couple levels of challenges first of all just to what all of you were saying it, it, journalism is a tribal profession and we do better Guidelines coming from the outside almost always are a, a, a futile exercise. It really helps when we are engaged in the process in ways that recognize that innovation in journalism happens journalist to journalist, story to story, and in partner, developing guidelines and best practices in partnership with you guys. Look, this is a very tough time in the field. Um, young reporters are coming into a field that's in the midst of technological change, 24-hour yeah. news cycles, constant need for social engagement, and at the same time, um, experienced mid-career and senior journalists are losing their jobs. This is true all over the world. So there's a crucial failure of mentoring, a loss of mentoring, mm -hmm. and even best practices that were developed and engaged over the last 24, 25, 30 years are in danger of being lost through this combination of technological churning mm -hmm. and the loss of mentors. Schools, which at the best time or where only about half the profession comes from, are struggling with how to include that. That said, there are educators around the world. I mean, Anne is here. There are mm -hmm. many in the US and the UK and elsewhere who are putting various kinds of trauma curricula sexual violence curricula in place in journalism schools. Um, that's also an area where some of you in this room who are advocates might mm -hmm. partner mm -hmm. with universities and mm -hmm. researchers getting baselines of research, developing stuff that can be implemented, even going in to speak to journalism classes, to news classes, to ethics classes about experiences of uh, being a survivor yeah. mm -hmm. uh, and so on can really change the way reporters think about it. Most reporters want to do a good job. Yeah. Yeah. They yeah. just don't have the resources, the mentors, the backing in their newsroom. The knowledge. To do the knowledge, often the baseline knowledge, to do it. So we need to, to create conditions that make it more possible. Okay, thanks. Um, we're run, we've run out of time, oh, but I would like to ask maybe Cindy to give a, a last word, just in terms of, I mean, you're talking about technology. I mean, obviously journalism is fundamentally changing in that regard. What do you think is the, is the best way that we can try to make social media work in a positive way rather than a neg negative way? I, I think that we can use social media 
to help change the dialogue and the discourse. And part of it is even our own language. It's, you know, instead of alleged victim, reported victim. Instead of um, domestic violence relationship, my relationship is not violent, my partner is violent. Yeah. And, you know, even, you know, tragedy is when a tree falls on me because of nature, and atrocity yeah. is when someone feels entitled and then chooses to kill someone. Yeah. How do we, and I do it all the time, I find myself on air, live television, saying domestic violence relationship, and I cringe because it's so baked in to our ethos that we use these terms. So I think social media, we can actually you know, do the hashtags and redefine what these words mean and then gently you know, challenge each other. And when somebody tweets and says domestic violence relationship, quote, tweet back and say, great point, and... What about abusive yeah, yeah, yeah. partner, not abusive relationship? There is okay, actually thanks. a project in the UK, and you might know the name of it, where there is a journalist, there is a woman, an activist, who goes in and rewrites headlines so that the... Uh, so that, you know, again, Amanda Carroll this morning, I hate to use it, but it was, you know, murdered mum. It didn't actually mm. give her agency. Um, and so um, this project in the UK actually goes in and re... And rewrites really and reframes it so it's a really good thing I think it's very interesting as a project okay we've run out of time uh, thanks so much to our wonderful panel thank you to Cindy to Bruce to Anne to Adele and to Luke and thank you to all of you to listen, for listening so attentively